Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending the Future of Safety, Se Future of Safety Science webinar series. Before we begin, we would like to go over a few quick housekeeping items. First, all participants are encouraged to enter any questions that they may have into the questions box of their GoToWebinar control panel. We will be monitoring the questions box and asking questions to our panelists. Next, all participants will be muted during today's presentation. And finally, this presentation will be recorded for future use, which we plan on posting as a video on UL.org, the Underwriters Laboratory's website. With that, I would like to introduce everyone to Dr. Kelly Kina, Director of Education and Outreach for Underwriters Laboratories. Kelly? Awesome. Thank you, Dennis. Good afternoon and Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Future of Safety Science uh, series after what I hope was a safe and restful winter break. In this series, we are asking the big questions about how the world is engineered to keep us safe. Every month we have conversations with our experts in safety and sustainability, have the opportunity to drill down into specific inquiries and research, and describe the process and impacts of global standards. And in this series, we get to talk to you. Um, we get to talk to our audience of young people, of young professionals, and our up-and-coming world changers. Um, as a teacher and professor for many years, my students always wanted to know what careers actually looked and felt like. So what is the day-to-day, -day, but also what are the paths taken to arrive in a safety science career, a STEM career, a career in research or standards? So as showcased in our panel today, one conversation I've really been looking forward to for a long time, um, STEM career paths include the researchers in the lab and the standards professionals who get to apply that research and people who uh, get to communicate that research in a way that is meaningful and relevant to all of us, no matter what field we live and work in. So no matter your aspirations, this is a really valuable conversation about your young careers, and we are excited that you're here. As Dennis said, there's a questions tab in your control panel. Please use this. Um, uh, it's on the right side of your screen. We really want to hear from you this evening. We want to hear the questions that you have, and um, feel free to engage with the presenters that are here today. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing you to our facilitator, who is going to then introduce you to the panel. I am thrilled to welcome Jeff Beckham. Jeffrey Beckham Jr. is the Chief Executive Officer at Chicago Scholars, a college access, success, and leadership development role, or program, excuse me. In his role at Chicago Scholars, Jeff is responsible for leading the development of the organization, which helps more than 4,000 first-generation and low-income students reach their dreams of pursuing a college education. During his career, he's worked with, uh, worked in both the formal, excuse me, worked in the for-profit, <laughs> non-profit sectors, and in an array of fields such as technology, education, and community economic development. Really great background. So Jeff, thanks for your time and energy and being here today. I'll turn it over to you and ask our panel to bring up their video. Thank you, thank you. Good evening, everyone. We're so excited to have you and I'm really excited to moderate uh, a panel of so many distinguished young professionals. Uh, I am excited for the conversation we're gonna have today. And without further ado, let's get into the conversation with our kickoff icebreaker fun question. So we'll start with Dennis. Dennis. What was your job, your first job, and uh, first, if you can introduce yourself and provide your, your name, your job title, and then answer the question, what was your first job, and how did that learning relate to what you do today? Thank you, Jeff. Uh, well, my name is Dennis Avalar. I am a digital content developer on the UL education team. Um, now, my first job, I can't say it was just one, really. My first job was about when I was and about eight, nine years old, uh, my dad at the time, he had a small business where he used to buy trucks and he used to uh, like fix them up and then export them to, to Guatemala. So my job and me and my brothers was to clean some of the most dirtiest <laughs> vile trucks you've ever imagined. Um, but we did that as, as a way of helping my father's business. Um, and then when I actually got a job where I received some kind of income, was about 13, I believe, when I started caddying 
uh, at a country club nearby. And there I learned like the value and the definition of the word privilege. I was about maybe four feet tall, soaking wet, maybe 90 pounds. And so these bags were like grossly like heavier than I was. Um, but I did it and it taught me, you know, just keep going, just keep going. 18 holes is a lot. Um, and finally, the first job in which I received an income and actually paid taxes um, was as a lifeguard at about 14 years, I believe, 14 years old. And there um, I just learned patience and how important that is to success of a team. Wow, thank you for that. Uh, very diverse background. I think uh, you related it well to what you're doing today and we're excited to learn more about what you do uh, here at UL. Becca, why don't you uh, kick us off too? Same question. Hi everyone, my name is Becca Schrader. I'm a research intern with UL's Fire Safety Research Institute. I'm also a senior at the University of Maryland studying fire protection engineering. Uh, my first job was when I was in high school and I worked at um, the local bread company um, back in my hometown. So um, kneading bread, making bread, uh, making sandwiches, selling it. Um, so through that job, I definitely learned the value of teamwork and how important it is um, in so many different areas of life, whether in the job or out of the job. Um, and I've definitely taken that with me. Thank you so much for, sh for sharing. Uh, Daniel. Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel. I'm a research scientist at the Electrochemical Safety Research Institute. And my first paid job was when I was uh, 17, 18 years old. Uh, I was a lecturer in a, in a high school. I used to teach all the math and physics courses, going from algebra to calculus. And one thing that I learned at that time is that the best way to learn is by teach. And I apply, I apply that uh, these days because every time you want to teach someone about some topic, you need to first learn the topic and then you need to think about how to explain it to the other person and i think uh, i still apply that uh, that talk nowadays thank you so much for sharing I, i'm uh, really interested to hear how your time as a teacher translates into the work you do today um so i'm excited to learn more about you grace yeah, hi everybody. Um, my name is Grace Rowe and I work as an international standard specialist. Uh, my first job was in high school where I worked at a daycare after school. So I would arrive uh, to that daycare just in time to change a bunch of diapers and give out snacks to some hungry kids. Um, one of the things I did learn though was to listen to people's stories. Uh, those families, they really shared a lot with me and you know they share their struggles and their needs and things that I would have never learned if I had just, you know, looked at them and, you know, passed their children off as they were coming to pick them up. And I think um, it really impacts the work I do even now because it makes me think about not just the tasks or the to do list that I have, but, you know, thinking about how the work really impacts people and families in a very personal way. Thank you for sharing. Joshua. Hello, hello. Uh... My name is Joshua Johnson. I am a standards specialist, project manager uh, at Underwriters Laboratories, working in the standards department. My very first paid job was actually working at Captain D's. So, you know, we all got to start somewhere, a little fast food, cooking some fish, some fries, moving them along. Uh, one thing that I've learned was, you know, uh, one great motivation for you to be the best that you can be is realize you don't want to be broke. So you go out there and you work and, you know, you put your time in and, try to calm that ladder and really become a leader. But then one thing I really learned that stuck with me to even now is, no matter how well you develop a plan or that you lead, it's really gonna take the team and the people standing with you to actually see the mission happen. So really using your support staff, um, other staff members, employees that you work with, uh, use the people around you inside of your circle to help propel you to where you wanna be at. Love that, no person is an island, right? We, we all have to rely on each other. Uh, Jennifer? Hi there, I'm Jennifer Williams and I'm a senior content specialist with UL's uh, Fire Safety Research Institute team. I work alongside with Becca. Um, and my first job was in middle school and I worked at the beach at a little shack where we sold snow cones and pretzels and rented beach umbrellas and chairs. And uh, from that, I really learned how to anticipate people's needs, you know, hey, you're getting a snow cone, you're probably gonna be pretty warm, maybe you'd like an umbrella. You know, it was a small thing, but 
uh, really learning how to talk to people from all ages and, and walks of life, um, stirring up conversation, trying to figure out uh, how to serve their needs as best as I can has really helped me today to communicate with people of all walks of life and understand uh, what they need maybe before they need it and uh, to be able to connect them with resources that we have to offer. So very grateful. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing. Uh, now let's get into it. Uh, I think this is actually another good question that it would be good if uh, the, the, the audience could hear you all answer. So I know it's a little diversion from what we said before, but this one is important because it's about your why. Uh, it's why you chose a career in safety science. So uh, if we can just go around again, we'll kind of reverse order and start with Jennifer this time, but I would love for you all to share why your career in safety science. Jennifer? Sure. Um, so not long after I was selling snow cones, I joined my local volunteer fire department at the age of 15 and just fell in love with fire safety and helping the community. And um, my dream was to become a career firefighter. And I ended up taking a different path and uh, learning more about communication and working in the um, public fire safety realm and ended up getting this job at UL. And I'm super grateful because I'm able to not only just make an impact on fire safety locally, but globally through our team's work and to be able to see how we can take research and turning in, turn it into resources and training, not only to keep the public safe, uh, but my fellow firefighters safe as well is, is a very important passion. And I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for that, Jennifer. I think it's almost uh, serendipitous that you know we're having this panel today in a, a heightened time where it's the coldest day of the year and, and typically um, fire safety is, you know, that much more important where folks are using space heaters or, um, you know, so I, I almost kind of think that it's it's very timely that we're having this conversation. Um, Joshua? Well, um, how did I get here? Um, so I've done a lot of different things in my past, everything from education to entrepreneurship to fast food to just doing jobs to do. And then, you know, after a while, you really start getting to that point that you really want to find something that's worth doing. You know, how can you make an impact? I literally fell into this opportunity. Um, and then once I actually got into it, I started really learning more about the people. And there's so much passion that goes on when you find the right place where you want to work. Um, and I can tell people that I work with a lot of teams on, what motivates me to keep going is seeing everybody else and helping them to be successful. And seeing everybody bought into this idea of making the world a safer place, it just seemed like a good fit. You know, it, 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 it's kind of like what I will say is you will always have a bunch of different ideas and opportunities and things that you want to do. Try them all. But then when you find that sweet spot job, it just feels right. And, you know, it's, it's not necessarily what people say. You find something you do and you'll never work a day in your life. That's never true. But what you will find out is that you'll thoroughly enjoy what you do, that you'll put the time, effort into accomplishing that. And that's how I am where I am today. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Grace. Um, you know, if I'm going to be honest, I didn't choose a career in safety science. Um, I actually left a career that I loved as a classroom teacher and thought I was going to retire there, but I was in a point in my life, we had moved and it was a new district and I had young children and I really needed that balance. Um, I felt like I was just barely surviving. And so I did what I never thought I would do and I left um, and found a new job. And I looked for a job and an opportunity where I thought I could bring skills that I've gained over the years, um, things that I could leverage in a totally new and different career. I had no idea what that was going to look like and how that would pan out. Uh, but I did learn you know, that an organization that seems very engineer-based and safety science-based still needs a whole slew of other people who support that work, um, ranging from people in finance to communications and project managers and all different types of people. And so I find it an incredible luck to me that I have landed here in Underwriters Laboratories and it has such a strong mission that, you know, I think like Joshua said, um, it's meaningful work and I'm so glad um, that this is where I've ended so far. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. I mean, I think it is important to, uh, to you know, talk about the value of work-life balance, work-life integration, the value of family. Um, and I'm really grateful that you share that with us. Thank you. Daniel? Yes. 
For me, it was a fortuitous for event. Uh, I never planned to study a safety science. Um, my life always was uh, back and forward between science and technology, basically theory versus some applied, uh, applied science, like uh, engineering. So when I was doing my undergrad, I started in applied math, but didn't like because it was too much theory. Then I moved back to mechanical engineering, where I started working in some electrochemical systems, something called fuel cells. Then uh, during my master's, I keep working in fuel cells, but I got bored because for me it was too applied, but there was few math. And then I got back to math. Um, and then at that time, I decided, okay, I, I can do a PhD. And in my PhD, I switched gears. I stopped working on fuel cells and I started working in lithium ion batteries. And that was the moment where I started focusing on safety because my project was related to um, safety of lithium ion batteries. And that's how I end up in, in this area. Thank you for sharing. Becca? Yeah, so I grew up in a fire service family. My uh, father is a career firefighter, and I always just found his job so fascinating um, and always wanted to learn more about it. Um, also, growing up, I loved engineering my math and science courses. And when I heard of fire protection engineering, it seemed like a great fit and blend between um, fire safety as well as research. Um, and then in my senior year in high school, I heard about UL FSRI, um, and I've just absolutely loved my time here, um, kind of echoing what Jen said, um, having a passion for fire safety um, and being able to conduct research on fire dangers while also making the difference in lives of others um, is just something that I absolutely love and am blessed to be able to do. Awesome, awesome. And certainly last but not least, Dennis. Yes, I'd like to say that uh, I didn't land on safety science. The path actually chose me. I have a, a background in creative arts. I actually studied film and video production. And so for me, I never thought something like this was, was even possible. I applied to the, the position. Um, and even then I thought, there's no way. You look at what the company does. and There's engineers, there's scientists, there's fire scientists, there's chemical scientists. There's former NASA scientists that work at UL. And I thought, yeah wouldn't stand a chance. And even when I got the job, um, I didn't believe it. But once I started working at the job, once I started applying myself a little bit more, I saw that, you know, there's some engineers and some scientists that could be incredibly intimidating to someone from my background and my lack of expertise. But the more you stick with it, the more you realize, like, everybody brings their own strengths to the table. And maybe I don't have that chemical background. Maybe I don't know, you know, physics or, or, or a whole bunch of different topics. But I do know my topic and I know it well. So I use that and say, okay, well, this is a team effort. No one person is supposed to know science or every bit of science from you know top to bottom. We all bring our strengths to the table and that's what makes us succeed. So for me, the path that led me here, it wasn't something that I even in school or at any point thought I would ever be here. And I'm grateful that I am. Thank you for sharing. Um, Becca, I wanna ask you this question because I think it's uh, very timely and relative to the students. So. What was the hiring process like for you and what can students expect and what can they do to be best prepared for the process? Absolutely, that's a great question. Um, so for me, the hiring process, um, I submitted my resume and the cover letter um, and then I was selected to um, have an interview. So I met with our director of ULFSRI, went through the interview process and then was offered the position as a research intern. Um, I would suggest for students um, get involved in universities wherever you can, whether it be research opportunities, leadership opportunities, um, even just extracurricular um, programs outside of school. Um, and then also just focus on your coursework as well. Um, I think by having a good blend of school and extracurricular um, things on your resume, that'll definitely help to set you up for um, whatever career you may be pursuing. Thanks. Someone else would like to answer? Yeah. Well, I guess I'll jump in. Why not? I guess. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I? Did I no, no, no. Go ahead, Joshua. Okay. Okay. Um, well, for me, um, like I said, I'll give you a, a different way of looking at it from, like I said, I'm, I'm solely like a project manager, purely. That's what I do. 
Um, so even when I came into the hiring process, um, there was a lot of different things where when I first walked into the building and I started looking around, I was like, wow, like, uh, you know, you start reading all the engineering things on the wall, science, technology, and I'm seeing all the engineers walking around. Um, and, you know, at, at first it started kind of getting me a little nervous. Um, but what I will always tell people and give advice for is as you move forward, you know, be yourself. Go in and just put your, your best foot forward and presenting who you are as you're going through the hiring process. Because, you know, there are different stages that you're going to go through and different things they're trying to ask you to just figure out who you are for the most part. And one thing I can tell you before you even go through that process and you're doing your application, take your time and research the company. Look and see what they do. What are their missions? Where are they located at? Um, nowadays, you can really find a lot of information on various third-party sites like Glassdoor where you start getting more information of what the job is telling you outside of the description. And then use that to make your decision to write your resume, to actually apply for the job and study for these different things. So when you go into the interview, you're more prepared in what they're looking for versus you just selling what you're offering, I guess we'll say. So, you know, it's definitely a process that is unique with everywhere you go. Just be smart about your planning, researching before you move forward with your process. Thank you. Daniel, no, you had an answer too. Yep. So for me, it was a little bit different. The hiring process was smooth. Um, I had my interview with my, with my boss and everything went well. Uh, one thing that I would like to advise students is uh, if you are a foreign student, you also need to do some additional paperwork in terms of uh, immigration. Like you need to request some permits to work here, and you need to do that sometime before you even finish your career. So be prepared for those uh, for those documents, like to get to get those documents on time, because that that will make the difference between getting the job or not. If you don't have the right documents, then even if you are the right person, you will not get the position. Thank you for sharing that, Daniel. I think it's a unique perspective. I know we have uh, students from all over the world on this uh, this web webinar, so I appreciate you sharing that and giving some insight. I got a, a little left left field question for you. Um, you know, I'm sure uh, Underwriters Laboratories gets inundated with resumes and all through the online channels. Do you have any tips or, or tricks for the students on how to navigate or circumvent getting caught in systems online? Patience. I would absolutely say patience. Um, try to design your resume in a way that describes you. Before I actually started working at Underwriters Laboratories, I worked in public transportation. So I designed my resume to kind of look like a bus route schedule. And so it looked a little bit different, but it still, it described me, not only like some kind of artistic abilities, but also like my background and what I brought to the table. You got to think about it in this way. Recruiters are probably, like you said, inundated with a number of resumes. They're looking at your resume for an average of maybe like six to 10 seconds. What can you do to get somebody's attention in six seconds with just a sheet of paper? And so that's why make it about you, but also, you know, list all your jobs, you know, list all your criteria and qualifications, but just stand out, make it a little bit different and it's okay to do so. Thank you for that, Dennis. And I've got another nugget for him. If you all have not already added everyone that's listed here on LinkedIn, you should be doing that now, students. So if you write these names down, add them on LinkedIn. They're here to help. And I'm certain that after this webinar today and down the road, if you're watching this recorded, they'll be more than happy to talk with you about UL and how to be part of the organization. So just another nugget, the uh, people presenting and speaking are usually there to help. And if you add them on LinkedIn, I'm certain they'd be more than happy to, to help you learn more about or get plugged into the organization. Um, another fun question for you all. Uh, we talked about your why. But why Underwriters Laboratories is a company, right? There's a lot of safety organizations out there. You could do public service, civic work. Jennifer, you've worked in the fire industry before, but why Underwriters Laboratory as an organization? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, so before working here, I worked at a state fire training agency um, organization. And when I heard about this job, it was really the, the global impact and also um, just the the weight that the UL name carries. Um, it's something that's recognized and respected and knowing that they have a lot of resources and it's really a great place to be if you wanna get something done, really. Um, 
there's a lot of amazing people that are part of this team. A lot of people on this webinar are incredible to work with. And it's just, it's almost <laughs> puts me speechless to think about how to describe it, but just really understanding that it's not um, an organization that just focuses on one thing. They really are looking at safety as a whole. And of course, there was a nice home for me to focus on fire safety, but um, Underwriters Laboratories is really thinking about all things safety at home, at work, um, just your every day. And that was just really uh, inspiring to be a part of versus a lot of other organizations, like you mentioned, they're doing great things, but maybe it's on a very small scale, they don't have a lot of resources, or maybe it's something, you know, very specific, or they're selling a product, you know, what we're doing, we're, we're conducting research and putting information out there for free. And a lot of the people that want to use this information have low budgets, don't have the money to obtain it. So to be able to give knowledge away for free is pretty exciting. Sounds like it. Sounds like you really like the work you get to do, uh, Jennifer. It, it comes through your passion. <laughs> Someone else who would like to talk, maybe Grace, why, why Underwriters Laboratories? Sure, yeah, I can answer that. Um, you know, again, so I was making a career change. So honestly, you know, I was looking everywhere <laughs> and coming up a lot of companies and, you know, talk about the job process. That's it's difficult, you know, please be ready to know that it can be long and like Dennis said, be patient. Um, but I saw you well and I noticed the simple, I didn't know much about the company, I didn't know much about standards, but I I could recognize the symbol. Um, it was enough that when I did make that career change, um, you know, I could tell my parents, look at your rice cooker and that is who I'm working for. <laughs> so, um, I think like a lot of people have said, that tangible mission of making the world a safer place um, really did resonate with me. I care about the environment too. And like Jennifer said, the breadth of work that happens um, really meant a lot to me. I wanted to know that if I was gonna make a career change, I wanted to be in a place that really cared and did something very meaningful. Um, and again, like I said before, I made that career change because I needed more balance in my life. and you know, during my interview process, I could tell that this was a place that would help me find that. Um, and I've just learned that, you know, my director cares for me, um, not just on a professional level, but on a personal level. You know, I love the people that I work with, the teammates, um, the broader organization, and I know that they care for me. And I realize as I'm getting older that those things are really meaningful, you know, not just the job itself, but the people that I work with and the way that, you know, they care for me. Grace, you, you really uh, hammered something home there, and I hope the students heard that when you said, my director cares for me. Um, in, in the world that we've all been dealing with and faced with the last couple of years, right, where stress is higher than ever, mental health and wellness has been challenged by being, uh, you know, in a pandemic, isolated for quite a long time. Um, the value of people and the people we get to work with, the people that care for us directly, I don't think you can beat that. And I, I hope as the students are listening, they're hearing how all of you have said something about the people you work with at least at least twice. It's come up at least twice for each of your statements. And I think that's just an important thing I hope students are, are pulling out of this webinar is that it, it really sounds like there's some amazing people at UL. And uh, for the few of you that I've gotten to know, uh, you know, Josh and uh, many others that are listening, uh, you all do have an amazing team, a uh, great team to be part of. I'm gonna shift gears a little bit uh, with the next question. So. You know, what is the value of diversity in the workforce uh, as you see it play out in your role? And maybe you can get a, give an example of how it's been valuable in the work that you do at, at your organization. One of the things I'll bring up uh, just off of the top of my head here immediately is travel. If you're somebody who doesn't like immediately know much about the world or you're just stuck in, in your general vicinity, um, science is certainly going to bring that out of you. I, I, before UL, you know, I was limited to where I've been visiting or places I've gone. Now at UL, I've had that experience completely opened up. I've been able to go to different parts of the United States. At one time I had a chance to go to Europe. Um, and for that, I think that's part of the diversity. It's, it's because, you know, maybe my, my Spanish language doesn't help me on day-to-day -day basis, but if I have to travel for the organization, I represent the organization wherever I go. So I want to represent it to the best extent possible. And if I have to speak in Spanish, I do so gladly. I know what I'm saying. Um, and another thing is just to see more people that can relate to us. Again, it's a team environment. We work with a lot of people with 
multiple backgrounds, but if we were all one in the same, after a while, we wouldn't be serving a mission to help the world. We'd be serving a mission to help one in ourselves. So for me, that's the part of diversity that just makes it so much broader and so much better of an organization. Thank you, Dennis. I guess I'll, I'll piggyback in there on Dennis. And I'll give you two different kind of perspectives. So one was standards, you know, what, everything we're doing is around standards development. And these standards are usually in international, regional, global, all different ways you have to have standards here. And everything that we do is actually working with diversity in different locations, people, fields, manufacturers, producers, supply chains, and bringing everybody to the table to work towards a common goal of maintaining standards, making them better for everybody, how to be able to introduce safe products into the marketplace. So the number one thing with your job, especially working in a sort of global company, is you're gonna to have to be able to work with diversity of many, many different people and understanding how to work with them. And even more specifically to what we do as a organization internally, um, there are a lot of different business resource groups and a lot of teams that are out there that are all spent on the idea of increasing diversity. The more people that we bring to the table and have these collective conversations and talks, the more that we can push our company to really represent everything that we want it to inside of the global marketplace. If we really want to be somebody that affects the globe, we have to make sure that everybody in the globe has a seat at the table so we can all really address the needs for everybody. So diversity, as you will see, as the more and more you get into your career, it's more and more important to be able to communicate, understand, empathize, and talk with people to come up with a common resolution. Yeah. So I would like, I also would like to add something. Um, diversity, especially in the research area, is very helpful. I I look at the every problem like a puzzle with a thousand pieces or any number of pieces. And every perspective provides uh, one or two more pieces that give you uh, like a full perspective of the whole problem. Let's say if I have a, if we're studying some particular phenomenon, we can ask a scientist, a chemical scientist or a material scientist or someone related to modeling or fire, their perspective. And then when you put all of them together, you can come up with a better solution. So it's very helpful to have different perspective, especially in the world. Daniel, you actually just spoke to us 20 years ago, right? When I started my career as an intern at Navistar, I worked in the uh, director diversity's um, office. And there was this big thing all around the industry it was called the business case for diversity. Um, there has now been numerous reports and studies that show that when you have diverse perspectives, right? Diverse research done, diverse analysis, it leads to greater outcomes. And in the end, a greater bottom line and positive results for companies that value diversity. So you you hit it on the head with that one. Um, let's let's dive into you all a little bit. Let's learn a little bit more about you because I think it's important for the students to know that you all are real people. Uh, you know, you see titles and names and sometimes it seems a little bit intimidating. So you know, what is something you do to manage work-life balance? and what are some of your interests outside of the job? I can talk about this one a bit as a student and um, also managing work. Um, so one big thing that I have had to learn um, over the past four years is the importance of time management and whether that means every Sunday sitting down and planning out my week, when I'm gonna work, when I'm gonna do my homework and all of that, it's really helped me to be able to um, manage both work, school, and also still have free time to do what I enjoy. Um, a couple of hobbies that I have outside of school and work, I really love to golf. Um, I also play the piano and I also enjoy hiking. Thank you. Can we get another taker on the that question? I think that's a fun one. Then it's just smiling. Go for it. <laughs> yes, yes. I try to keep myself busy. That's for sure. Um, before, uh, a few years back, I was training for the Chicago Marathon, which this was pre-pandemic and I was able to do. Uh, Post-pandemic, unfortunately, I hurt my knee, um, so I wasn't able to run. But then I took up cycling, which was a lot easier. So I do a lot of like activity, especially outdoors. Uh, I just love to be outdoors um, during the warmer weather. Obviously, now in Chicago, that's not a possibility. But um, in terms of time management, it's it's more like planning ahead, knowing your work, knowing how long things are going to take. Um, but surprises do come up, so we have to adapt to it. 
Now for me, other stuff that I like to do, um, I like to write. As I said earlier, I come from a creative background. Um, so one of my things that I did while working at UL is I was able to publish my first novel. It's um, 558 pages long, which is bigger or longer than, than the first two Harry Potter books combined. So if I can work at UL and, and complete something of this magnitude, um, it goes to show that you know we can have a work-life balance. Even if we work in science, that's incredibly demanding. Um, it all goes into what we put into our jobs and we could take that away and just still have um, lives of our own. That's awesome. Uh, I'm a I'm a cyclist too, Dennis. So I'm a got my trek uh, checkpoint three out here, ready to go once the weather breaks. Uh, really, uh, a big proponent of work life balance. It's really hard to achieve all you can if you're not your best self. Um, I, I heard a few people have quoted this, but they say if you take care of yourself and you take care of the people around you, the work gets done. And so just a note to all the students listening to this: like, take care of yourself, practice good self care habits take care of the people around you and the work will get done. So uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Would anyone else like to answer? I'm, I'm sure the students would like to hear from you. Sure, I can answer that. Um, for the work-life balance part, something I learned, especially over um, this COVID time, really having to figure out boundaries and when to say no. You know, we were all working from home for so long and the lines kind of bled back and forth between home and work. Um, and of course, there's always fires happening. Um, there's always messages to share. And so it's it's really easy, at least for me personally, to just constantly be on my work phone, constantly checking my email, constantly waiting for another message. Um, and I also run social media for our team and it's tied to my social media. So I'm just always, always in it, which is, is hard to kind of turn it off. In a way I like it because I'm passionate about it, but it does get hard to blur that, um, make that line. And so, learning to say no, setting some boundaries, and also finding a time to cut off when you check your email. <laughs> it will wait until tomorrow. Um, you know, like you said, you've got to take care of yourself first or you're not going to be able to, to do your job. So that's taken me all this time to learn, but we're getting there. Um, and outside of work, uh, I do enjoy working with my community. I work a lot with, with teenagers and uh, my husband and I run a small nonprofit that helps uh, get prom dresses to girls and work with uh, people that need things in the community. So just really love working with people and, and helping out where I can. And I also like to make parody videos. So if you're ever in need of one of those, I gotcha. <laughs> oh, I gotta, gotta find you now, Jennifer. We gotta follow you. See, you all didn't know you were gonna learn so much about your panelists today, but I am a big proponent of understanding who we are as people because I hope that you all see students that these are real human beings too. Like outside of what they do for work every day, uh, they have families, they, they like to laugh, they like to enjoy life. And I think that it's very important for you all to see that um, where you are in your moment. I hope you're getting your questions together. We're going to answer, uh, I'm going to ask one more question, then I'm going to turn the floor over to you. So again, if you see uh, in the chat, you can actually place questions there and we'll make sure that those are answered by uh, our panelists here. Um, before we get and pass it over to the students, uh, what's one celebration and one challenge you've encountered along your career path? How did you overcome the challenge? I, I believe in giving young people tangible things that they can take with them. And so again, what is one celebration and one challenge you encountered along your career path? And how did you overcome the challenge if you did? I guess That's I can, tough. I'll get started with this one. Yeah. Um, and that was a tough one. It's actually something that I recently did where you know, um, as you all mentioned, you know, the work-life balance, you get so entangled in everything that you're doing and trying to be the best that we can do and also finding time to cut off and just get away from it. But then I recently um, actually took on the endeavor of getting my project management certification, my PMP through PMI. And um, it came down to a point literally where you're going to have to decide that you really, really want it. Um, and that's what it really came down to. It was the most challenging thing that I've done um saying with a very short timeline you know a lot of people was like oh well you can't do it you're doing too much you know it's going to take you at least three four or five years to get this done um but i you know i kind of had to sit down and buckle down and say okay this is what i really want let's make the time let's create the effort let's build a i'm a project manager let's build a plan on how we're going to get this thing done um and just everything that you'll go through you'll find out when your friends are calling you and they're like hey let's let's go out and go uh, to the movies or let's go kick it somewhere or you know, I'm really 
big into motorcycles and cars. So, you know, you want to go for a ride somewhere? No, I need to sit down and do work and I need to get it in because, you know, there's always a larger goal. Um, so I was able to actually accomplish that goal. And then once I looked back on everything, the reoccurring theme was uh, don't let anybody tell you what you can do and it, what it can and cannot do. And if you really want something bad enough, you will go out there and you will get it. So, you know, as you all start to really think about what do you want to do, don't let anybody discourage you or tell you know that your goals are too big. Really just go ahead and look at it. And if it's something that you really want, you'll create that plan, you'll get it done. And it will be that much sweeter when you actually accomplish the goal. And then you'll realize you don't want to be stagnant. There are more things to accomplish and more things that you can impact and help out. So be ambitious and the world can be what you want it to be. You just spoke to something, uh, Josh, where there's a really good book called The Power of Habit. And in that book, they they break out, like, how do you accomplish large goals just the way you did, right? If you want to save, you say, I want to save X, Y number this year. Divide that over the 12 months it'll take to get there. Think about every day. And then you'll start to think about your spending habits differently, right? When you go to Starbucks, which has gotten really expensive now because of inflation, you know, this, this $9 oat milk pistachio latte i don't need this every day anymore right like but it does because again nine times five is 45 bucks a week and you start to sh you think about that over 52 weeks a year and how much money we can save and while that's a small example you, you hit it on the head about then committing to spending time to accomplish the goals we have for ourselves whether it's a certificate whether it's being able to volunteer and provide extra service hours if you're in school uh, becca talked about getting actively involved in your campus all of the things that you you may not feel like you have time for now if you look and, and really readjust and organize your priorities you may very well have time for that so thank you for speaking to that i wanted to pull that out so that the students could hear hear that for sure yeah definitely yeah. you know one thing you always remember if you fail to plan then you plan to fail just create your plan and go for it you'll got it yeah, I would also would like to comment on that. Uh, I think for me, my biggest celebration was getting my PhD in one of the uh, top ranked universities in the US. It's a, it was a big challenge, at least for me, because I'm coming from a different country where sometimes you have some mental barrier, people, uh, or sometimes you think, oh, I don't have the enough, um, knowledge or enough uh, I'm not I'm not ready to take a course in a in a graduate school or maybe whatever I know is not sufficient to get a, a degree and also there is a language barrier which you need to overcome uh, but once that you stop hesitating and stop like uh, overthinking about those things and you decide to actually try it then that's the moment when you start succeeding not the moment when you get the final degree but the moment that you overcome those mental barriers and for me getting my phd i think was one of the biggest moments so if you think that you can do something but you don't feel confident enough i will say just try it the worst thing that it could happen is that you fail and then you can try again and again but if you think you can do it just try it Great advice, and I should be greeting you properly, sir. Dr. Juarez Robles, you earned that title. You earned it. Uh, we, we have four PhDs on my staff at Chicago Scholars, and I, I always call them doctor whatever because it's such a, a, a you know hard process and not many people will accomplish that. So doctor, we're gonna make sure we, we address you properly. Um, and actually, as we think of, and move into the, the student portion of Q&A, uh, the first question is actually for you, uh, Daniel. Dr. Juarez Robles, it is, how do you, or how does a non-native English speaker need to prepare for this field? Uh, so one thing that you need to know is uh, whatever they teach you in your own country or in your own language is enough to succeed here. What you need to work on is in the, in the language. Like uh, for me, before 2015, I, I never speak in English. So I got here and I started I started taking courses in English, while at the same time I had to learn some some new knowledge. So it was a challenge, but after some time you get used to it. Actually, English was the 
the last of my problems. I still, I'm still working on it. My, I still make some mistakes, but I try to fix it. There are multiple tools online that help you to correct all the mistakes and accepting that uh, you made mistakes is, I think it's one of the first steps. If someone say, hey, uh, you say something wrong, you say, okay, I'll try to fix it and then make sure you move forward, yeah. Thank it's you. difficult, but it's, it's feasible. Thank you. Uh, this is an open question for the group. Uh, what do you think the secret sauce is to securing a first job? How do you get noticed when you're just starting out? Um, it's not one secret sauce. There's no one secret formula to you know solve everything. Um, one of the things that I will say is just to get over your sense of fear. Uh, for me, when I finished uh, high school, I didn't really have a direction that I wanted to go other than I knew what I wanted to study. Um, but when I was close to finishing college, my fourth year, I got a job opportunity at this incredible company, which coincides with not only the biggest disappointment I've had in my career, but also the biggest triumph. Um, I turned down the job because it was something I didn't know. It was something that it was like far away and I didn't want to you know, take the train every day. It, I did it out of fear. And I regretted that decision for like 10, 15 years thinking, why didn't I take that opportunity? Why didn't I take that opportunity? And instead of taking that time to like learn more and to apply myself, I just kept thinking, well, maybe I should have taken that job. Um, it wasn't until I got the job at UL that I realized, no, it was all worth it. I overcame my fear. And so when I found that, you know, I was offered a job at an organization that was far beyond my comfort zone, I immediately said, yes, I'm going to do this. And if I can't figure it out, I, I will do everything I can in my power to, to be the best that I can be. Um, but like I said, there's no one secret formula. You have to do what works best for you. Um, always remember that, and here's, I'm from Chicago, so here's a Chicago reference. Michael Jordan wasn't the very first pick when he got drafted in 1984. He was the fourth. So it was three other people that everybody thought these were going to be better. The best that ever lived in the sport was actually the fourth pick. So it's okay to be that fourth pick. Number 16 was actually John Stockton. He was a Hall of Famer. So look at it that way. Just because you're not the first doesn't mean there's not another opportunity around the corner that's waiting for you to be there, that you will be like that number one choice. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good analogy, Dennis. And to pull it into more 2022 terms for the students, Ayo Dosumu, who's from University of Illinois, was a second round pick. And I think last night he had like 25 points. So again, you may not be first, but that doesn't mean you can't be successful uh, with a little bit of hard work and elbow grease. Um, we don't have any other student questions, but I do have another question for you all. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you could put your thinking back caps back on and we could go back into a time machine for some of you not that far back, Becca, uh, when you started college and you can give yourself a piece of advice. What would you tell your yourself as you think about the framing of when you started school and where you are now? Is there a tangible piece of advice you would provide yourself? I Grace? could go on this one. Um, I would look back and tell my very uh, type A personality that had everything really well planned out, that life uh, comes at you really fast. And even the most well laid out plans may happen, but they may not. Um, a pandemic may come in and take over your life. Um, if you've noticed, my light goes on and on, on here because my kids are running in and out of the room. Um, you know, just I think to be flexible, to have those big dreams and goals, but to be flexible um, and to know that it might not work out the way you think it might. But I think like Dennis said, everything along the way, you're going to be able to put that to good use and you're gonna learn from all those ups and downs. So uh, yeah, the older I get, the more I realize I just don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's comforting or not. <laughs> I think it's real. Um, you know, there's a term that I learned in a couple leadership programs called VUCA. And it's actually a term that the military uses to describe the current world we live in, which is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. But there's ways and like specific skills to overcome each of those. And a lot of it just is rooted in transparency and honesty. And then just thinking through, like just, you know, roll with the punches, but prepare for them, prepare as best Absolutely. as you can. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, what you're speaking to, Grace, is a lot of that. Um, who else would like to answer? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go, because I'll be real honest about this one, because, you know, everybody's not going to tell you the honest truth. So um, what I would tell myself, well, I'll, I'll take it back a little bit. 
So I went to the great North Carolina a and State University out in Greensboro, North Carolina, one of the premier HBCUs out here and a historically black college and university. Um, and what I will tell you is that you should be ambitious, but enjoy the process. So what I mean by enjoying the process is they will tell you all kinds of things when you start about you know, what you should do and how you should do it. And they'll have you look to your left and look to your right. Um, you're going to have your ups and downs that's going to knock you off your horse. Now I'll be the one that'll put myself out there because I was the one that was on your left that failed out the first year. But you know what I had to do to realize after the fact was that I wanted it more. I couldn't take failure as an option. And let's go back out here, get on this horse and get it done. And, you know, I had to jump back out there and, you know, I didn't get a chance to do a lot of things, you know, my freshman and sophomore year that, you know, historically you would want to do. But, you know, if I can go back and tell myself anything is don't worry about everything else. Just enjoy the process. Time will go forward. You will live. You will learn. You will figure it out. The main thing is to be ambitious. Find the things that make you happy. And if there's something that you want to try, try it. Um, and that's something that I was at least fortunate with. You know, I thought I was going to be an engineer. And then I got into the math and I was like, this is not going to work for me. Um, <laughs> then I went that I was going to law school and all of the reading. And then when I really figured out that law isn't like Perry Mason, I don't know what y'all watch nowadays. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> back in my day, we had Perry Mason where you would get up there and you would have this big argument going back and forth. Oh, it's like power, I guess. But life isn't like that necessarily. So, you know, it took me a while to figure out what I really wanted to do. Um, don't get discouraged. Go out there. Be great. Try a little bit of everything. You will find your way through. That's awesome. And as we close, first, we've got a couple other comments. So we've got uh, a, a nice, a wonderful teacher leading something in New York for us. Um, they said, congrats to you, Daniel, on your PhD. Uh, and then we got a, a, a quote that says HBCU Fisk right here. So Joshua, you are not alone uh, in the <laughs> HBCU love. Uh, we got one. We do have a question actually from uh, a student. If there's one thing uh, you want everyone listening to today to remember from our conversation, what is that one thing? So as we close, maybe everyone can answer that. And uh, we'll close out with that question. What's the one thing, the one takeaway? And we'll kick it off with uh, Becca. Becca, you can kick us off. I think um, this kind of ties into the last question of just looking over my past three and a half years that I've been at school is just to enjoy um, where you're at and just take a deep breath and know that it'll work out and pursue what you're passionate about because um, that will bring you a tremendous amount of happiness. Um, yeah, and just enjoy the ride. Let's go to... Uh... Joshua, close. what's the closing words from you? Do not be afraid to be great. One thing we've learned in COVID is that time is so precious and you don't have to be great at 18, 16, 14. And honestly, I just turned 37 and I still think there is still so much that I'm here to accomplish. Um, so just go out there, put your head up, go tackle life and make the most out of it that you can. And like I said, it will all work itself out. But the main thing is continue to be happy in everything that you do. Dr. Juarez Robles. Uh, for me, it's just um, think out of the box. It's okay to be different. And it can take you to some places that sometimes you don't expect. And enjoy the journey. Dennis. I would say it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And I can say that because I ran a marathon. But the, the whole point of like career path is the fact that it's a long path. And it's going to divert you in all kinds of directions, most of which you're not going to be ready for, and a lot of those that you're not going to be prepared for. Um, but you can make the most of it. Just because if there's a bump along the road doesn't mean you fail. It just means you have something else to learn and something to overcome. But your limits are as far as you want them to be. But don't think of it that just because I'm 22 years old and not the CEO of my own company that you've become a failure. Don't think that just because you're not a director at the age of 27, you're a failure. These things take time. And if you want to lead that life and, and work your way up to the top, you know, to the corporate ladder as soon as possible, hey, good for you. But if there's others that are seeing that they're not going as fast as everyone else, not just in the workplace, but in life in general, it's okay to have slower marathon times. The whole point of it is just make it to the end. You'll see the reward once you make it to the end. And it's not about that day of, 
It's about what it took you to get to that point that makes you who you are. Grace? Yeah, I'd say, um, you know, find people and surround yourself with people who will encourage you and be your cheerleader. Um, I think about even here at my work, you know, I've got other other moms and, you know, my shoe, especially during this pandemic, and we're cheering each other on as we've got kids screaming in the background and we're trying to be in meetings um, who really understand what you're going through and is willing to tell you you need a spa day <laughs> you need to take care of yourself too and so um, finding cheerleaders and then being that cheerleader for other people when they need it we all need that i think and you know in different times and jennifer similar to what dennis said but uh i heard this quote once don't compare your beginning to someone else's middle everyone's gonna reach where you are from a different path um you said transparency earlier, so important. I don't have a bachelor's degree. I got to my position through an associate's degree and related to fire science and uh, various different experiences uh, that made me fit for this role. And it was a role that I never knew would have existed. And so there's a lot of my friends that all have, you know, doctorate degrees and all of these wonderful things and various stages in their career, but I'm content in, in where I am and you should be content in where you are and the various path that it's taking you to get there and don't, you know, feel less than because maybe you're not on the, the typical path <laughs> that the, the world likes to create for us. It's, it's your path and like everyone has said on the call, make it your own, do it your way and you'll get to make an impact that you are meant to make, not the impact that somebody else is making. So comparison is the thief of joy so just live your life <laughs> yep and uh as we close first thank you all panelists for spending time with us this evening and the students uh, you all have been amazing 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 uh my parting words to the young people um, i said it earlier today in an interview i did continue to pursue purpose uh, find whatever it is your purpose for about you believe in go at it as hard as you possibly can and don't be detoured. As Jennifer just so eloquently stated, what is normal now? <laughs> Everything that we thought is normal was turned upside on its head. So, you know, be creative, be innovative, and be passionate about your work. I'm gonna pass it back to Kelly, who's gonna close us out. Awesome. I'm just feeling very grateful for you all that I, I get to have such incredible colleagues and Jeff for you and your perspective. and um what you've added to our conversation this evening so just with a very big heart full of gratitude for tonight's conversation um next time when we meet again for the webinar series we will be having a conversation from our standards engineers who are going to be talking to us about um, sustainability and cybersecurity in standards so UL engineers Denise Durant and Caroline Troidhart will talk with us about how scientists and engineers develop standards that incorporate cyber resilience and measure sustainability um, in how we think about what's coming up in, in standards development. And we have hit a nerve here. We have more registrations for this up and coming webinar than, um, than any other. So don't miss out on this conversation as well. Um, you know, we are just getting started in the spring semester. We have many more coming up. The schedule's here on your screen. And Jess has placed a link in the chat to register for those if you haven't already. And then as a final note, we really want to hear from you tonight, next time, and in between. So please do reach out to us on LinkedIn. Excellent advice. Please do go to ul.org and check us out a little bit further and um, you know, let us know if there's questions, comments that you have uh, about more that we do. And also, we're gonna send you a survey to, uh, to send to us and give us your feedback on tonight's session, the webinar series, and to see how we can do better for you all um, who are our audience and our stakeholders. So, uh, you know, again, Thanks very much for this very open, very um, honest, and very incredible conversation this evening. Just really grateful for your time. Okay, everybody signing off. We'll see you next time on the series. Take care. Stay safe. Bye.